Christ is risen. Alleluia. Grace and peace to you from God the Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. 1971 Ford Pinto. Maybe some of you know this car. I don't know. Maybe some of you remember this car. Why am I talking about the 1971 Ford Pinto on Easter Sunday morning? Well, I discovered that this car was on a list with other things like this. Things like the Dreyfus Affair. The Teapot Dome Scandal. Big Tobacco. And Watergate. And if all of those things maybe immediately brought to your mind a recollection of those historic events, then you're more of a history buff than I am because I had to look them up. But they are all examples of massive cover-ups. Uh, the 1971 Ford Pinto is on that list because during the production of this vehicle, it was discovered that there were some serious safety flaws and issues. Yeah, the, some of the connections to the fuel tank could easily become broken off and detached in a rear-end collision. There were bolts that were sticking in certain places that would puncture the fuel tank in those types of collisions and increase the likelihood of a fire occurring after a crash. And the engineers at Ford, when they discovered this issue, they realized that it would take about $11 per vehicle to fix it during production. But they decided that it would be better or cheaper to just pay off any consumers that were seriously injured in an accident because of this safety concern. And so they didn't fix it in production. That's why the 1971 Ford Pinto shows up on that list that I shared with you, a list of who was truly a traitor against France selling secrets to Germany in the late 1800s, a list that contains shady and lucrative business deals that top government officials made with oil companies and executives over land in Wyoming, Politicians who broke the rules, did things that were illegal, violated people's privacy and security. They were cover-ups. Massive cover-ups, moments in history when some felt that they had a right or for their own self-seeking reasons that they should go to excessive lengths to hide the truth. And some of them worked for a while. People didn't know the truth until others went to excessive and extreme lengths to uncover the truth. Investigative reporters and journalists and concerned citizens and politicians who wanted to do what was right who wanted to seek out the truth, expose the truth, and share the truth with others so that they could be secure, so that they could be in a better position in life, so that their safety would be protected. And we can add another item, another event to that list the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Dear friends, today you are confronted with this astonishing, amazing, maybe even seemingly unbelievable news that a man who was dead, unquestionably, undeniably, he had been executed in a cruel and calculated way that ensured death. He had been placed in a tomb, wrapped in a cloth, a stone rolled over the front, sealed him in, and the claim is that this man 
He was alive again. He defeated death. He rose up from that grave. Resurrection of Jesus Christ. Is it the world's greatest truth? Or the world's greatest scandal? Greatest conspiracy? The world's greatest cover-up? And we're stunned by this resurrection account of what happened on that Sunday morning. But Matthew, the one who's writing it for us, he pursued those facts. He researched them. He presents this historical narration as if he was an eyewitness because he was an eyewitness. He was there in Jerusalem. He heard the reports from the women. He heard the information that was then given out by the Jewish leaders and chief priests. He heard the narrative that they spun. All this messaging. He was there. He listened to those women. The women who had gone out to that tomb, who questioned who would roll away that massive stone that was in front of it. They wondered and they pondered, and yet they were the first witnesses. And along with them, also as first witnesses, were those guards. Guards who had been stationed out by that tomb. And when this earthquake occurred... And this angel came down and rolled the stone away. They were terrified, so terrified that they passed out and fainted. Those soldiers, with their military training, their strict orders to prohibit anyone from touching that tomb, anyone from getting near it, to stop them, armed with swords and spears, they fainted. They were terrified. But the women? Women with no military training, no self-defense classes, armed only with their aloes and their spices, they were not. They might have been nervous, curious, confused, maybe, scared, maybe, but terrified, no. They weren't terrified because they had a different expectation and a different anticipation. The soldiers, they just expected humanity in that tomb. They, they were on high alert for Jesus' followers to come and ma- steal his body. Maybe these women, maybe that's what they were up to. But they just expected humanity. They didn't anticipate divinity, but the women who came out to that tomb, they acknowledged Jesus' divinity, and so they expected more, even if they didn't know what it was. They anticipated and expected the miraculous. And so when we hear These words that there was a violent earthquake and an angel of the Lord came down from heaven going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. These women were not fearful. But rather their different expectation allowed them boldness. It allowed them courage, inquisitiveness, and a totally different response than others. But Matthew continues to report on this resurrection context And he tells us how the guards went into the city. And they reported to the chief priests, and notice what it says, they reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. Because they also were among the first witnesses. They clearly had witnessed that stone rolled away. And after they regained their senses, they probably went inside that tomb and investigated and Think about why they were there. I mean, they hadn't done their job. They hadn't kept it secure enough so that the message of a resurrected Jesus couldn't be proclaimed. And does it strike you as strange that they were even there? I mean, think about the context, the history here. The Jewish leaders, the chief priests, They wanted to get rid of Jesus. 
Uh, they wanted to, to squash his following, but hadn't they got what they wanted? A dead Jesus? He had been crucified. Isn't that what they were asking for? But, but they needed more. They needed not just a dead Jesus. They needed a false Jesus. A lying Jesus. An untrustworthy Jesus. A weak, powerless Jesus. An erased Jesus. And they had told Pontius Pilate, they had said to him that if the disciples had come and and had stolen Jesus' body, that that deception would be worse than the first, what Jesus had been teaching the people. Now, if there was any hint that Jesus was alive again after his death, if, if there was any rumor that started spreading that he had conquered and defeated the grave itself, they knew that that would be far, far worse for them. That would have far, far greater of an impact on people. And it explains their cover-up. When the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, you are to say, his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. It's a massive cover-up. This meticulously crafted, orchestrated lie to hide the truth. I mean, they went to such great lengths to make sure that people knew that Jesus was dead, even posting that, to, that guard. And even then, when that guard failed, then they bought them off so that they would tell a lie. Even in the face of these remarkable events that could only be the hand of the Almighty God, they refused to acknowledge. And perhaps we wonder why the soldiers' own witnessing, the soldiers' own account that they gave to them, why didn't that change the hearts and minds of those chief priests? Why didn't this miraculous event clearly declare to them, why didn't that bring them to faith? Well, the pride in their own hearts covered up the truth that Jesus wanted to declare. You know, they paid off the soldiers to fabricate a story, and yet they were the ones who accused Jesus' followers of deception. But you know what's remarkable about that? Jesus' followers, they didn't need to be paid off to talk about a resurrected Jesus. They would face ridicule and rejection and poverty because they spoke the name of Jesus. The followers of Jesus, they didn't need to cover their own rear ends because of a time when their courage failed them and they fainted when they had a job to do. But they rejoiced because they knew that for every single moment when their courage had failed them, Jesus had covered over that with his forgiveness with his blood shed on the cross, and his resurrection to new life meant that it was all true. They were emboldened by the love of Christ. And that's why they would be willing to risk their lives, even give their lives to proclaim the kingdom of Christ. Sane people don't die for what they know is a lie. But Jesus' followers knew it wasn't a lie. They had witnessed it. They had seen it. And so they weren't forced, but they were compelled by the awesome weight of this truth to speak of the message of a living Jesus. A resurrection of Jesus. World's greatest cover-up? Scandal? Conspiracy? Or the world's greatest truth? The followers of Jesus, they took their stand on that truth. And now today, the Bible calls you and I to take our stand on this truth. Are you compelled by it? 
by its awesome weight? Will you sift through all the fabrications, all the lies that are out there that try to cover up this miraculous truth? Because they're still there. The cover-ups are still there. They're, they're out there, and they're also right in here. Our world says, YOLO, you only live once. Through his resurrection, Jesus says to you, I have given you a new, eternal, and everlasting life, a life that continues after death. Society says that you need to make the absolute most out of your time right now, right here. You need to be as successful as you possibly can because that's all there is. And if you fail, it's your fault. Through his resurrection, Jesus says to you, when you fall and you fail, I forgive. And I empower you to live the next day in my grace. This world says, you do you. Do you know what that means? It means you're the only one who matters. It's the most selfish, self-centered approach to life that we could take. But in his resurrection, Jesus says to you, I have won your freedom. I have forgiven all your sins. You have everything in me. The wealth of heaven. And so I have set you free to serve others. To love them. In a world of so many attitudes that create so much chaos and so much pain, Jesus says you could take the attitude that creates peace. Because you know what I have won for you. And it is eternally secure. The world says that the best thing that you can do for your family is to set them up for success. To to work as hard as you possibly can, even past the point of exhaustion, because you need to give them everything. But in his resurrection, Jesus says, the best thing you can do for your family is to point them to me. Because I'm the one who gives a full life. And as we listen to all the things that the world tells us, don't, when the problems come and the challenges come, doesn't it amount to, to frustration, exhaustion? But we know there's something more. We know that we need to be clothed with the imperishable. We need to have glory and power not to compare, continue in the perishable, in weakness and in shame but there's this massive cover-up in your own heart that you need to fear death. And Jesus, in his resurrection, he says to you, do not be afraid. Now, if Jesus' resurrection is a cover-up, if it's fabricated just to help us to cope with all the challenges that we face in this life, then that is, that's pitiful. But if it's truth, and it delivers an amazing hope, an eternal and an everlasting hope. But a cover-up can be inside of our own hearts too, right? Because if it's true that Jesus rose from the dead, then everything he did and everything he said and everything he asks of us, it matters. Are we willing to live as if Christ is our King? Are we willing to live as if Jesus has risen from the dead? Or do we sometimes let those fears and those struggles of life cover up that amazing promise as Jesus calls us to live in him? And so, dear friends, I want to ask you to come today to this resurrection event with a different expectation, a different anticipation in your hearts, the anticipation, the expectation of Jesus' divinity so that you can respond like those women with courage and boldness and inquisitiveness and faith. So that you can be free to completely orient your life around Christ Jesus. To live with him as your king. 
so that you do not allow your guilt or your shame to take away that thought, but you take every thought and you make cap- it captive to the word of Christ. You listen as he speaks his words. Do not be afraid. He is no longer dead. And Jesus is not a liar. He is not false. He has not been erased or eliminated. He is trustworthy and true, and he is powerful. It's a truth that can't be bought with a cover-up. And I just want you to listen to those words from the angel one more time. The angel was so confident in the facts. The angel said to the women, he said, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus. He knew exactly why they were there exactly who they were looking for. Looking for Jesus, who was crucified. Yes, Jesus died on the cross. He gave his life for you and me. There's no question. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Jesus had already talked about this. Jesus had already proclaimed that this would happen. He had already looked forward to this. When when the angel said, He is not here, says, come and see the place where he lay. You can ask Joseph. You can ask Nicodemus. They laid him right here. He was here, but he is no longer. He is alive again. Then go quickly and tell his disciples. He's going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. You won't just see this empty tomb, but you're going to see him alive again. In the flesh, the same Jesus, you will know that his is the victory. He has overcome the grave. And the angel finishes and says, Now I have told you. I have spoken the truth openly and clearly. There there is no doubt. You can take it. Nothing is hidden here. It's real. It's yours. And in the empty tomb, you know that God was pleased. You know that you are forgiven. You know that you have the righteousness of Christ now. You know that God calls you his own dear child. It's an amazing truth, so freeing, so hopeful, so joyous, and it's all you need, the beautiful truth of the resurrection. When you think about a cover-up, a cover-up often occurs because of something really, really bad. Things that people have done that are unethical or immoral or hurtful, Really, really bad things. But Jesus' resurrection is really, really good. It's not a threat to your safety, but it's the promise of eternal security. It doesn't fill you with cancer, but it cleanses you of the cancer of sin. He's not a leader who's out to make it rich, but he's a king who wants to make you rich with his grace and his love. Jesus' resurrection saves, and it empowers you for a new life. It empowers you. So as you look ahead to the life to come, you can be a better husband now, a better wife now. You can be a better father, a better mother. You can be a better son, a better daughter. You can be a better citizen, a better friend. Not because you must not because you got to meet some standard, not because otherwise God is going to come down on you hard, but because you are compelled by the awesome weight of this incredible, amazing truth that Jesus is risen up from the dead, that hope is yours and peace is yours. This is the foundation of the Christian faith, and it can be the foundation of your life true. So, dear friends, my prayer today is that you are compelled to seek the truth. That you are compelled to expose this amazing truth and share the incredible truth of Jesus, a living Jesus risen up from the grave. Amen.